right. Hello, everybody. It looks like most of us have arrived. Welcome. My name is Mary Ann, and welcome to Getting Ready for High School English. Um, it's really an honor for me to be here. I am a former high school English teacher, so I've had a lot of experience with teaching the kinds of things that I've been tutoring now for many years. So throughout my years of being a tutor, I've tutored both high school and college students. And um, most of the time, I'm working with students who have received a prompt from their teacher, and they're not sure what to do with it. You know, they're just not sure how to answer the question. Um, <clears throat> so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk a little bit about the type of writing that you're going to be exposed to as a high school student. And um, what we're going to address is a particular genre of writing that usually comes up toward the beginning of high school, um, freshman or, um, or sophomore year. And that's called the literary analysis. Um, but before we get to that, I just want to let you know that if you have any questions during this presentation, uh, you can drop them into the chat area. Also, um, WiseDant is going to email you a copy of this record, uh, recording, and then also this recording will be a part of their um, their uh, YouTube playlist called, you know, Getting Ready for High School Writing. So you can, or Getting Ready for High School English. So you can always check us out there if there's anything that you want to review. Um, all right, so I'm going to share my screen with you. And I'll come back, excuse me, and uh, meet you at the end. All right. So today we're going to talk about the literary analysis. And um, the reason why I was excited to do this presentation is because last year I was thinking about the student that I had who uh, I had been working with. And he was really upset because his mom signed him up for AP English, um, a AP literature for the next year. And he told me, um, you know, Marianne, I, I hate this. I don't like to analyze literature. It's, it's just not what I can do. It's not my favorite thing. I just hate having to analyze characters and um, I just don't like it. And so to help him, I, gave him some information about not just how to write a literary analysis. You know, we can quantify this experience. We can organize it. You know, there's just things that you have to do, moves that you have to make to do this task. And But if you don't know what those moves are, it can be very scary and a little intimidating. So when I was working with this student who was just really adamantly, once he started to do those literary analysis, uh, papers, um, the first thing we did was we kind of broke it down. So what is an analysis? What does it mean? Um, all of the other genres of writing that you've been doing up till now, and you'll continue to do, um, like the, the argumentative essay, or the personal narrative, or the synthesis paper, or the descriptive paper, or the expository essay. Um, these are all different genres of writing that include collecting evidence and, you know, taking a stance and um, pers maybe persuading your reader about something. But it's the analysis part of the literary analysis that seems to scare or even confuse some people. So what does analysis mean? Well, it's not that complicated. It means identifying the subtext. Okay, so the subtext is the stuff that's going on in a novel, in a play, in a short story, um, that is kind of below the plot. So we have the plot, you know, bubbling up, uh, you know, bubbling along, the, the characters are doing things, but it's in the subtext where the themes develop, 
the big ideas come in, you know, the meaning, why are these characters doing this? Or what does this mean? You know, what, what are the implications of these things? And so analysis means identifying that subtext, which is the small but important parts of the text. Okay. And these small but important parts lead up when they all connect to these big ideas. Another thing about analysis is that you have to explain how these parts, these little parts, connect to that interesting idea within the big text. And then analysis doesn't end there. You have to then connect that interesting idea that you uncovered to the real world, you know, to, to bring it out. And this is what we call answering the so what question. You know, what's the point of this paper? It isn't just to identify all these things, it's to kind of identify an idea that you can attach to the real world and then that makes it interesting it should make it interesting for you as a writer and then it should make it interesting for your reader now with my student who said but marianne i hate analyzing literature i did talk to him a little bit about the benefits um and to tell you the truth, it kind of worked. It kind of moved him toward not hating analyzing literature. So the benefits are this. Doing this work allows you to interact with these great writers and doing this analysis, you know, in addition to reading, reading is one thing, but really analyzing gives you access to what we call the experiences of the human condition. You know, you're reading about these characters going through these things. And um, these are things that you might, might, ne might never go through on your own. So it gives you access to experiences that you might have, might never have, or you might have had. And, and, and so you can connect with them. Um, but it also gives you access to the brilliant writers um, whose works of literature have made it into the American high school canon. So the American high school canon is that big list that high school English teachers um, agree on uh, for, for the texts. And when I say text, I mean the novels, the plays, um, the short stories, you know, whatever it is that you're analyzing. This is an agreed upon list. And the, the, um, the things that make it into this list um, have value. You know, they have value to you and they, they'll have value to you later, um, you know, throughout your life. You'll be, um, hopefully you know constantly going back to the things that you've learned while you were reading your um your english assignments um but there's you know another interesting benefit to doing this kind of work and it, it kind of ties into a little bit of psychology there's a thing called narrative empathy and um bibliotherapy and this is where by reading about a character's problems or plight, you, it kind of elicits some empathy in you as a reader. Um, or, or reading about a character's struggles with a problem that maybe you are also struggling with. Um, there's actually a, a form of therapy called bibliotherapy where you read, um, you know, a story and, and you see how a character kind of resolves that thing and that can help you resolve whatever issue you've been going with. And so, so, you know, interacting with these texts give you interesting ideas, right? Interacting with this text in this way makes you a better reader. It also makes you a better writer because you're getting this practice. It makes you a better thinker because you have to think pretty deeply. And maybe it makes you a better person, right? It, it allows you to open up your heart a bit more empathetically to people in the real world. So the, the problem then, you know, with my student, he, he said, well, how do I come up with these ideas that add to what's already been said? You know, and how can I make a credible analysis? You know, how do I respond to the big ideas of this text with my own ideas? You know, it's a bit intimidating. How can I comment on um, F. Scott Fitzgerald or Hemingway? Well, there's an answer to that. And it's called intertextuality. And it's a big word, but what it simply means, and you've been doing this 
probably so far, is that your paper will weave together the traces of the text in the form of paraphrases and quotes into your own ideas. And so you do the writing that goes around the traces of the text that you bring to your paper. So you always have something to respond to. So how does it happen? Well, let's get started. Here I have, it's as easy as one, two, three. And these are the three steps that you need to take to get you started so that you have a really clear path into writing this analysis. The number one step, or no, I shouldn't say the number one step, the first step is to complete the four pre-writing tasks to find a working thesis. So I'm sure you've all written theses before. You know, that's the, that's the couple of sentences or the one sentence that states the, the focus and the purpose and the point of your paper. Well, you've got to do the same for a literary analysis. And the best way to find a working thesis right away is to deconstruct the prompt. So your teacher is going to give you a prompt and these literary analysis prompts can get a little complicated because you're dealing with a pretty complicated, you know, piece of work. So um, the thing that you do is you deconstruct the prompt and you look for cues to follow to create a question to answer. Okay, so this is all about creating a question. The human mind is designed to answer questions. And so if you sit down to try and write a thesis as a statement, you could sit there all day and maybe not find anything. But if you sit down and deconstruct the prompt to write a question to answer in your paper, your brain has something to focus on. So I wanted to show you how this might work. So I, I took the liberty of pulling together some prompts that um, I've come across. And uh, I wanted you to notice that I underlined certain words. So here's just the first the example number one of a literary analysis prompt. And I'm going to read it out loud. Select a character whose origins are unusual or mysterious. Then write an essay in which you analyze how these origins shape the character and that character's relationships and how the origins contribute to the meaning of the work as a whole. So I underline the key words of this prompt, select a character, origins, unusual and mysterious. Okay, this is what I would gather together to write a question related to this prompt. Here's another prompt. I just want you to see kind of the variety of prompts that you might find uh, coming your way. So the next example, read the text carefully. Then consider such, considering such elements as imagery, symbolism, and tone, write a well-organized essay in which you analyze the relationship between music and the protagonist's complex memories of her family. All right, so look at that. They, your teacher is giving you the, what, what you should look at and then telling you what to do. So here's just another example of a literary analysis prompt. Consider how the protagonist confronts his uncontrolled emotions and yet attempts to abide by social norms. In a well-developed essay, analyze how the author explores the complex interplay between emotions and social expectations in the text. You may wish to consider such literary techniques as dialogue, narrative pace, and tone. So these are fairly complicated texts, but you shouldn't worry because by the time you get these prompts, remember that you are going to have had a lot of time reading and discussing the novel. Let's just um, kind of stick with the text as novel for now. You, you might have had small group discussions. You might have had projects. Um, you might have had to act out a scene from the novel. So you've had plenty of time to interact with this novel. And by the time that you get this literary analysis, 
you should feel very comfortable, you know, with the what this prompt is saying. Because most teachers, most English teachers, will use this literary analysis as a, um, what we call a summative evaluation. In other words, this is like the final thing that you will have to do in that unit of, of that book. Um, and this is, that's why we call it summative, because it's sort of like the sum of everything that you've learned. Um, so let's just kind of go through this step by step. So create questions to answer. So how do you do that? Well, let's take the prompt about music. Write an essay that demonstrates how the music depicted throughout the text shows the protagonist's complex memories of her family. Okay, I turn that into some questions and this is very easy. You just stick how, why, what, when, where in front of one of the sentences. So you turn a declarative sentence into an interrogative, a, a, a question. So how does music depicted throughout the text show the protagonist's complex memories of her family? That's, it's as simple as that. What kind of music is depicted? So I, I, I developed a few more questions to answer. What are these complex memories? Okay, so once you flip the prompt into some questions that your paper will answer, then you move on to step two. All right, this is, this is where you do the heavy lifting. You've got to read carefully and annotate the text. So now that you have some questions to answer, you look back at that text and you start finding the parts that will answer your question. Be aware of the subtext, remember? That's the themes that the writer is developing. But again, like I said up above, you are annotating now to look for the small but key parts that are related to answering your questions. And if you're not familiar with annotating, it simply means taking notes. Um, if you have a paper copy of the text, you underline, you circle, you write margin notes to yourself, or you keep a notebook. It's your way of responding to the text in the moment. And so by, by going back to the text to find answers to the questions, you're doing your research, right? So just like you had, if you ever had to write a argumentative um, essay, you know, right? You had to take a stance on something. Well, you had to go outside and get some research, get some authority um, to back up your stance, to give you some credibility in what you were saying. Well, you have to do the same thing here, but your research is done within the text, okay? So in our example, you would annotate all the parts of that text that talks about music, or the protagonist's complex memories of the family. Um, and always be aware, I have this here, of the word complex. It's your teacher's way of saying, all right, this is more complicated than you might think, right? If there's a complex character, it means that this character is not just one thing, right? He may look like the bad guy, but he's not all bad. Or he may be the hero, but sometimes he's not heroic. So be aware of that word complex. So your annotations now that you've done, and this, this is a, a big chunk of time, you know, that you have, to, you have to devote, should function to give you a whole new understanding of the text that answers the questions. Because in your first reading, you weren't focusing on this stuff, but now you are. So now you've, you've, got, your, um, you've got your questions, You've got your annotations, and so your head is just ready to explode, right, with all of these ideas. Now it's time to write a working thesis. So let's take a look. So from my, from my prompt to answer my questions, based on my annotations, I was able to come up with a thesis, a working thesis that sounds like this. So music represents the protagonist's complex memories of her family. Because whenever the sound of music is heard, the protagonist becomes depressed, showing her dependence on her family, particularly on her daughter, whom she resents. 
okay? So now I have a thesis. So this is gonna be the guiding force. This is the roadmap of the rest of my paper. So what's next? Well, you must stick with, and notice I have italicized here, with great determination to the specific points of your thesis. Okay, so your thesis is tightly organized in, in control and your paper has to follow that same tight organization. All right, so now step three, now that you have your thesis, you have the general idea, and remember, I call this a working thesis. All right, it, it, things might change as you investigate deeper into some of these um, issues that you're looking at. But for now, you need a working thesis. So now what do you do? Well, I have here, revisit step two if necessary, right? So if you didn't do enough annotations to get anything for step three, you've got to go back. But step three is called the hamburger outline, all right? And when I first told my student we're going to do a hamburger outline, you know, like, what? what are you talking about? Well, I, imagine a hamburger. Well, in my case, a veggie burger, because I'm a vegetarian. But, you know, you've got, you've got a top bun and you've got a bottom bun, right? And that just kind of holds the good stuff together, right? So the top bun you need and the bottom bun you need so that the good stuff doesn't just spill out. And so the top bun means something. Right, the hamburger means something in your outline. The bottom bun means something. So what does that mean? Well, we're gonna start with the meat, all right? The hamburger, the veggie patty. That is your quotes. That is your quoted material. That it, the, the meat of your outline is what you brought down from your annotations, right? And so your job is to grab four chunks of quoted text that relate to your thesis, right? That thesis that you created. And then you, you need two quotes for your first body paragraph, and then you need two quotes, different quotes, for your second body paragraph, all right? So you start with your quotes. That's where you begin. And then you write the top bun. So the top bun, is the context that you set up for the quote. And then you write the bottom bun. And the bottom bun is the explanation of the quote and how that quote supports your ideas. In other words, the bottom bun is your analysis. So let's take a look. I have this color-coded hamburger method outline. And you'll see that I have the introduction paragraph here, all color coded and what each sentence is supposed to do. But remember, we're not gonna start there because how can you introduce a paper that you haven't written yet? All right, that's just too hard. So we're gonna jump right to the body paragraph. So we're gonna start with body paragraph number one. Okay, so begin here. So you'll notice each of these color coded bullet points are different sentences, or maybe a couple of sentences, but they each do a different thing in your outline. So the first sentence is what we call the topic sentence, right? So you write your topic sentence for paragraph one. Now this is one sentence that begins your outline. I'm sorry, it be, well, it begins your paper, but it begins your outline here. And it has to connect to the thesis statement, but it has to bring down or draw down one topic from your thesis statement. That's why we call it a topic sentence. And then that one topic will set the focus for this paragraph. And you always write your topic sentences in present tense. Okay, so you've got your topic sentence and now it's time to insert your hamburger. The next sentences that you write is the context for the quote, for quote number one. So quote number one is already in there and you write the context for it. So you write two or three sentences and this just sets up for your reader who, what, where, why of this quote, like when did this happen? Who's talking? What was the situation that was occurring in the, in the novel, you know, when this quote occurs and then you write a little lead in 
and then you give the quote, and then you give the citation for the quote. And so your teacher will tell you what kind of citations you should use. These are called in-text citations. You know, some of them uh, use um, MLA, some use APA formatting, and your teacher will um, guide you with that. So you insert your hamburger or your veggie patty. Then you remember that bottom bun. So you have to write a couple of sentences. Now I have three to four sentences here. You know, you've got to stretch out this analysis um, a little bit. So you write your analysis for this quote. Now, how do you do it? Well, you point to the details or the words or the literary elements in the quote and you explain how they relate to your topic sentence. In other words, you give the reason why this quote is in this paragraph. Okay, so once you finish with your hamburger, you've done a lot of your hard work. The next sentence you write is just a transition sentence. All right, that's your transition to quote number two. And um, I say that you, this transition to the second quote, it can be a whole sentence. It can be just a, like a dependent clause and then a sentence. Or it can be just a simple conjunctive adverb like, in addition to this, 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 here comes this, this, this. You know, so the in addition to acts as the transition. And now you put in your second hamburger and you do the exact same thing for quote two, right? You write the context for quote two. You just tell your reader, where is this happening? Who's involved? Um, what's going on, uh, you know, around that quote? And then you give your lead in the lead-in is just like who's who if it's a um quoted something that someone says like some dialogue you have to tell the character you know as as gatsby says comma and then you get the quote so um so you give the lead-in and the quote and here i have some a, a little bit more instruction the quote should form a complete sentence so the lead-in and the quote should form a complete sentence and the quoted material should be no longer than three typed lines. You know, you can't just grab a whole chunk of quote and stick it in your paragraph because that's just too much real estate to take up with somebody else's words. You know, this is supposed to be your words. So you've got to learn if, if you feel like you're making the mistake of like putting in what like, quotes of chunks, chunks of quotes that are way too big, um, learn to paraphrase. You know, learn to put half of that quote into your own words, and then you can just quote the rest of it. So now to, to finish up body paragraph one, you write another, you write a summary sentence. And this kind of summarizes how your examples connect to your topic sentence. So it's bookended. You have your topic sentence, you have your lead-ins, your hamburgers, and then you have the summary. So body paragraph two, you do the exact same process right you write a new topic sentence for for body paragraph two so you grab another idea and from your thesis and you bring it down and now that's what this is this paragraph is going to talk about you connect the topic sentence to your thesis and um and that sets up the focus and then you introduce quote number three and you give the context for it the who what when where why and how a couple of sentences three sentences then you give the lead in you give quote number three and then you cite quote right there and then you analyze quote three okay so just like you did up above you point to the details and the uh the words, the literary elements, anything within that quote that you can use to relate to that topic sentence. And then just like up above in your first body paragraph, you have to transition to your second quote and you do the whole thing over again. All right, context for quote four is your top bun. Quote four is your hamburger. Your analysis for quote four is your bottom bun. 
and um, then you kind of restate the topic sentence because this is the end of your body paragraphs and you kind of summarize um, how your examples relate to your topic sentence. Okay, so following this pattern in this organization, you'll notice that it's um, pretty tightly organized. There isn't a lot of room for error. I mean, if you do this process, you're going to have two really fantastic body paragraphs um, because they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do in a literary analysis. Now, of course, we've got to go back up and write that introduction. So let's take a look. An in introduction. Um, you know, your teacher might have some ideas on how he or she wants the introduction. You know, some say, you know, it's got to be a full paragraph like this. Some say it doesn't have to be very long. But most literary analysis assignments do want you to have a nice paragraph as an introduction. And we, we can break the introduction down into each sentence and how it functions, just like we did in the body paragraph. So, for example, you can start with a general statement. Okay, this is a statement that hooks the readers. Some teachers will call the first sentence the grabber or the hook, but it should be general. Um, it shouldn't reference the text yet. For example, the student who I was talking about who didn't want to do literary analysis while we were working on his literary analysis of The Great Gatsby, and he came up with a fantastic general statement. Um, it was a question, and you can put a question in. And it was something like, um, how can a man gain all the material goods in the world and yet lose his own soul? Right? So that rhetorical question really acts as a hook. So you notice it's not talking about the text yet. It's just a general statement. Then you write a couple of linking sentences and the linking sentences will explain that general statement in more specific ways and you start kind of narrowing it down to sort of connect it to your thesis. All right, so you've got your general and then your linking sentences and then you introduce the author in the text. So this is where um, you include the author's first and last name and the title of the text and so this is the first time when you mention um, the author of the book or, or the characters, right? So it's, it's not the first sentence. It's always kind of tucked in the middle there. And then you give a little bit of a background information about the thesis, you know, whatever your thesis is and whatever it's pointing to, you, you kind of bring your reader down into that idea of the thesis, and then you give the thesis statement. And it's, it's usually one sentence, but it can be a complex sentence, um, you know, like a, a dependent clause and an independent clause, or it can be a compound sentence, you know, two sentences um, stuck together with proper punctuation to get some complicated ideas for the thesis. All right, so each sentence of your um, introduction has a purpose, it has a function. And now let's jump down to the conclusion. So you've done all this heavy lifting, you've done all this work, these annotations, this getting the quotes, writing the introduction. The conclusion should come easy. But for a lot of students, at this point in the writing experience, they get a little writing fatigue and they just write a couple of sentences and they're done. You know, they don't they don't know what to say anymore. But just like the introduction and the other body and the body paragraphs, Every sentence in the conclusion has a function. It has a purpose. So the first sentence should be a sentence that is the revised thesis. In other words, it says the same thing as a thesis, right? But it can't be, it can't sound like the thesis. So you have to restate it, but don't copy it. Because this reminds the reader of what you're talking about, like what this whole paper was about. Because your reader might have forgotten your thesis, and it's really good to remind right here in the conclusion, first sentence, what this focus was. And then you do a quick summary. Look at this, only one, two, maybe three sentences of the main points that you made. Okay, so don't go crazy here. You're not re rewriting the whole paper. But 
Instead, give a recap of, of each main point that you presented in your topic sentences. And then you make the uh, main points relevant to today. So you start bringing, just like you began in a general way with your first sentence and in your introduction, you begin to go, you begin to zoom out now in a general way. You start to bring these ideas to the real world. And then the last couple of sentences of your conclusion should answer the question, so what? Why should I care? What does this have to do with me? Um, you want to like give the implications of what you've found. And so your last couple of sentences should be kind of an insightful thought that leaves a lasting impression on the reader. Um, make, make some kind of interesting connection to what's going on today in the world or the future. Okay, so your, your essay is nicely bookended. You know how book ends or, or um, bookends kind of hold all the books together? Well, your, your first sentence and your last sentence should, should bookend your essay. All right, so that's a lot of work. Now I'm going to tell you, tell you about these problems, all right? I've been teaching and tutoring for many years and um, I've been able to kind of pull together the most common issues that I see with students who are writing literary analysis. Um, and the number one issue sometimes is that the paper doesn't address the problem. You know, they, they write a beautiful essay. It's perfect. It's well said, you know, grammar is great. The ideas are interesting but it didn't address the prompt. And so they, they veered completely from the, the assignment and the teacher won't accept it because they created the prompt that they wanted you to answer. So do if you do all that work with the prompt, you, you, you're definitely not gonna commit problem number one. But problem number two is, is really common and there's a lot of reasons for it. So the problem that I see is instead of developing the thesis, you just simply repeat ideas, right? You, you, you're, you don't push your analysis of the quotes far enough and, and you start repeating yourself. Or this is what students do if they really don't have a grasp of how to do the analysis work. They start paraphrasing this, or summarizing the plot. Because that's easy, right? Just talking about what happened, but they didn't analyze. Um, so they identify features, but they didn't connect them into an analysis. Or they simply restate the what happened in the in the text instead of saying like why or how, you know, going deeper. So remember, and I and I've repeated this two times, and now this is the third time. Analysis means the identification of the key parts, the small key parts, and showing the connection of those parts to your thesis. So another way in which students don't develop the thesis, they just kind of go somewhere else, is that they there's too much focus on personal interpretation. Um, this paper, this literary analysis, is an evidence-based writing. Right. It, so it's not the place for personal opinions. Um, you know, you would never start a sentence with I think, you know, or, or you wouldn't use I at all. Right. You're taking evidence from the text and you're analyzing it. Um, another issue that I see is that um, the students will talk about a character, um, you know, going on and on and on about a character because it's easy. And then you just don't explain how this character functions or how complex this character is and how this character relates to your thesis. So you've got to be careful of that. And then another issue, and this is kind of, you have to go back to square one, um, when the students don't do a careful selection of the quotes to support the topic sentences, no matter how hard you try, you can't just try to make a quote fit under a topic sentence if it doesn't. Now, if this happens, if you have some really great quotes, but they don't fit with your topic sentence, then rewrite your topic sentence. Make your topic sentence fit the quotes. So, you know, it can it can be back 
it, it, it can be kind of circular, right? Because writing is a process of discovery. So the more interaction you do with this text and the more writing you do in your hamburger outline, the more is going to be revealed to you about the interesting ideas. So the topic sentence that you started with, or even the thesis statement that you started with, might not be as good as the one that percolates up during the process, right? So don't be afraid to just go back and change that thesis or change that topic sentence if you found some really good stuff that, you know, you're a lot more excited about. All right, so to end my part of the presentation, I just want to show you really quickly how you can avoid these problems that I mentioned. All right, number one, your annotations, right? They shouldn't just like be circles and underlines, right? You, you've got to like interact with the text. This intertextuality, you know, you're bringing the author's words into your paper. Well, your annotations, you are interacting with the author's words. So your annotations should include questions like, why is this character doing this? Or why is this word repeated so many times? As well as what you notice about what's going on in the passage. All right, because some simple why or how uh, follow-up questions can get you thinking. They can facilitate analysis. And they can open up, I, I, like I have here, the complexities of the passage that you're looking at. Um, all right, navigate difficult diction and syntax. Now, the reason why I say this is because not too long ago, I was working with a student who was doing a um, literary analysis of the Odyssey. Um, you know, obviously it's a text that was not written in our century, so there's a lot of archaic words that, you know, you just don't, we just don't use. So you have to navigate sometimes this, this diction, that's word choice or syntax, you know, sentence structures. Um, you know, contextual meanings can help, but move beyond simple definitions. So you're going to have to take a little bit longer if your text was uh, not written in a language that you're really familiar with, like what we speak today. Um, number three, you should show that how something is said and why it's being said in your text is sometimes more important than what is being said. So when you're looking at your characters and you're looking at dialogue, you know, dialogue is one way that we get to know characters. Notice that characters in literature are often multifaceted and sometimes contradictory. So when I talked about the word complex, that's what I mean. Don't, don't paint your characters with a big wide brush. Look for the um, complexity in your characters. Okay, so number four, make an assertion about a possible meaning and then support that assertion with a quote that makes a clear, concrete connection. I mean, this kind of says it all, right? You've got, you've got to have that quote, you've got to make an assertion about that quote, and that connection has to be clear. And the last one, uh, the last um, how to avoid uh, the problems is just avoid too much summary. If you feel like you're, you're talking on and on and on about the plot, you have to stop yourself. Okay, because <laughs> the teachers read the book, they don't need on and on and on about the plot. You only talk about the, the chunks of the plot when it is analyzing or setting up the context for your quote. All right, that's the only reason why it should exist. All right, so um, that's the end of this sort of uh, presentation part. And so I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, I see that we have a couple of questions. So I'm going to, oh, I, no, I don't see questions. I just see some comments, right? So with that, um, if you have any questions about what I said, um, you can drop one in. I realize that I gave you a lot of information, um, but remember that WiseSense going to email you a copy of this, and um, it's also going to be put on their um, YouTube channel. And so you can always look at the video, and you can stop it, at, you know, during the uh, portion where I'm showing you the hamburger outline. 
and um, you can take some notes off of that. You know, and always remember that your teacher will guide you through this. So I've given you an overview of what to expect when you get this literary analysis assignment. Um, but your teacher might have different suggestions on how you might want to organize it. Um, although what I'm giving you is kind of a conglomeration of everything that I've learned, you know, from working with students across the country on this um, on the genre of writing. All right. So if there aren't any more questions, I do believe that we can finish up. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to be doing another webinar. And this one is on writing the rhetorical analysis. So that's a whole different animal with a whole different look. And so, so you can look for that from Wiseand. And then later, um, the first week of September, I'm going to be doing a, uh, a webinar on the top 10 writing mistakes of all time that students make and how to avoid them. And so this is more of a uh, kind of grammar, writing and rhetoric um, webinar. All right, everybody, you take care and um, good luck with the start of school. I know that we are all probably start, uh, you know, starting school online, you know, virtual, virtually, but you're still going to be getting these writing assignments. So do your best and um, stay organized. Bye bye.